Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today, I want to discuss the names of God and their meaning. I'm going to go over 10 names for God and their meaning, but today we will only get through five of them. Number one, God the Creator, Elohim. God the Lord, Adonai. God our peace, Jehovah Shalom. God our provider, Jehovah Jireh. God the covenant keeper, Yahweh. God the Almighty, El Shaddai. The God who is there, Jehovah Shammah. God the healer, Jehovah Rapha. God of power, Jehovah Sabaoth. And God is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. Let's look at the first five, and in the next video, we will cover the last five. Number one is God the Creator, Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim was hovering over the waters. And Elohim said, Let there be light, and there was light. Elohim saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. This first name for God is used more than 2,500 times in the Bible, 32 times in the first chapter of Genesis alone. Most scholars believe Elohim derives from the word El, which in turn comes from the word for strong. Specifically, this name means that he is the strong creator God. When we pray to Elohim, we remember that he is the one who is creative, powerful, completely sovereign, and gloriously great. Because God calls himself Elohim, there are at least four foundational facts about this name. Number one is he is eternal. Number two is creationism is correct. It is no accident that the first thing God wanted us to know about himself is that he is the creator. The whole revelation of scripture is rooted in this fact, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Number three, the Trinity is true. The I am ending of Elohim is a plural. This is similar to cherub becoming cherubim, and the plural of seraph becoming seraphim. Here's the cool part. Although the name Elohim is plural, it is often treated as a singular noun. Look at Genesis 1, 26-27. Then God, Elohim plural, said singular, let us plural make man in our plural image, in our plural likeness. Number four, every person has a purpose. Every person is made in the image of God and therefore has dignity, worth, and purpose. Let's look again at Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Number two, God the Lord, Adonai. When we say that God is Adonai, we are stating that he is Lord of all and that he is supreme over his subjects. God has some strong feelings about what he goes by, and he doesn't want us to use names that are too casual or even commonplace. I'm sure he's not real impressed when we refer to him as the big guy in the sky or the man upstairs. In the singular, the word Adon often refers to master and is also defined as lord or owner and is used for how slaves speak to their masters and subjects to their kings. In order to help us capture the meaning of Adonai, let's turn to the world of pets. A dog says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, and you love me. You must be God. A cat says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, and you love me. I must be God. In a humorous way, this captures how we often approach God. Number three, God our peace, Jehovah Shalom. You've no doubt heard the word Shalom before because it's probably the most well-known Hebrew word, 
but for many of us, we don't fully understand the depth of its meaning. The general idea is of completion and fulfillment and brings with it the sense of wholeness and harmony in relationships, especially with God. Shalom also signifies a sense of well-being on the inside and on the outside and is used to describe health, happiness, quietness of soul, tranquility, prosperity, and security. Isaiah pictures this beautifully in Isaiah 48 verse 14, quote, If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace, shalom, would have been like a river. Number four, God our provider, Jehovah Jireh. We know from the Bible that God loves to meet the needs of his people. He counts every hair on our heads and he sees the sparrows that fall to the ground. And because of that, he will take care of us. God provided for Daniel when he was in the den of lions. He came through for David when a piece of tiny gravel wiped out a great giant. He provided manna for the Israelites in the wilderness. He met the needs of a widow, and he delivered Gideon from the mighty Midianites. God loves to come through for his people, but often not until they let go. It strikes me that before we can know Jehovah Jireh, before we can experience God as provider, we must first be willing to obey him fully. Trust God to provide for your needs. When you do, you will find him to be your Jehovah Jireh. Jesus challenged his followers not to be anxious about what they would eat or wear or even where they would live. If we put him first, all these things will be added to us. Matthew 6.33 Hudson Taylor was famous for saying, quote, When God's work is done in God's way, it will never lack God's supply. Call out to Jehovah Jireh by name and ask him for his provision. But make sure you have first settled the issue of preeminence. Who is most significant to you? Who or what occupies first place in your heart? It's only as we sacrifice what is most important that we will discover that God is most important and that he will provide for us in a profound way. When you go through a season of testing, remember that Jehovah sees. When your month outlasts your money, God will provide. When you're feeling overwhelmed, God will provide. When you're troubled, trust in Jehovah Jireh. And lastly for today, number five, God the covenant keeper, Yahweh. The idea of a covenant is an essential teaching of scripture. God made a covenant with Noah in Genesis 9, promising that he would never again destroy the whole world with a flood. In his covenant with Abraham, Yahweh promised to bless his descendants through Isaac. In God's covenant with David, God declared that one of David's descendants would be the royal heir to the throne. This was fulfilled when Jesus, who was from the line of David, was born in the city of David. Our culture is more familiar with contracts than with covenants. Covenants are number one permanent. A covenant is a permanent arrangement. Contracts have an end date. Number two, total. A contract generally involves only one aspect while a covenant covers a person's total being. Number three, costly. The word itself provides some additional meaning as it comes from a root word which means to cut. This sounds strange to us, but when two parties would enter into a covenant, they would pass through an aisle with bodies of slaughtered animals on each side. The idea behind this is that if any party breaks the covenant, they would be in danger of becoming just like the cut up animals. In Exodus 24, Moses sprinkled the blood from the animals on the altar and on the people to demonstrate the covenant they had entered with God. When God makes a covenant, he keeps it. When he makes a promise, you can count on him. Psalm 105 verse 42, For he remembered his holy promise given to his servant Abraham. Psalm 119 verse 50, My comfort 
in my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. In the next video, we will go over the last five titles of God and what they mean. God bless.